Hello everybody, my name is Daryl Robert. Welcome to our event today where we're going to be talking about virtual production workflows based on the visualization guide from the Epic Developers community. We're live from the LA Innovation Lab. This is our facility to test and experiment with virtual production workflows. And I've got the pleasure of working with a few of my colleagues today. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about what you do here at Epic. Welcome. My name is Kevin Cushing. I'm the virtual production supervisor of the Epic uh, Innovation Lab. And before Epic, I had about 20 years experience in feature films and video games. Hello, my name is Sean Comley. I'm a solution architect here at uh, Epic. Before I came here, I was uh, in the visual effects industry for about uh, 20 years or so, working on uh, feature films and games. And I've been working in real time for about five years or so, and I never look back. Hi, my name is Juan Gomez. I am a solution architect director, and it looks like I'm another veteran in the VFX world. I was doing movies, commercials, you name it. And I also started using Unreal Engine since 2007. Happy to have you all here, and let's get ready for the event. Awesome. Well, it sounds like we all kind of started in the same spot and in the same spot, so that's really, uh, really kind of nice. Today, we're going to be seeing a variety of topics. We'll be talking about hardware here that we use in the lab, motion capture, virtual cameras, and playing around with the editor. We have a lot to talk about, so we've pre-recorded some of the content so that we can get through it quickly. Ask questions in the chat, and we'll do our best to answer them during the event. And make sure to stay to the end, where we're going to be doing a live Q&A session. So I, I think we're ready to go, man. Let's jump in there. All right, let's go. The Visualization Guide is a series of posts on the Epic Developer Community, where we educate users on how to use virtual production techniques in Unreal Engine to explore ideas and see them come to life. Chapter 1 is where we go over what we consider the foundational tools you will need to get started. And Chapter 2, which was just released, is where we talk about planning for your shoot as well as building stage tools with blueprints. Our mission in creating this guide is to share the resources available to set up a small virtual production studio using body and facial motion capture, as well as a virtual camera. Hopefully, existing studios will gain insights from this as well. In today's webinar, we are going to highlight some of the basics. So if you have an iOS device, and a computer that can run Unreal Engine, you can start experimenting with virtual production right now. Let's dive in. So let's jump in and have a quick discussion about hardware. Kevin, what's required for visualization and virtual production? Here we have a large ICV effects stage, which has a lot of equipment, which is definitely yeah. not necessary to get started. You could be using an iPhone and a laptop to jump right in. Okay. I'm gonna show you what we use for the linear content guide if you come this way. You can see we have a much smaller space dedicated to the equipment for the guide, and I'm going to get into the details now. Okay, let's check it out. For the purposes of the linear content creation, we have a simple setup of four workstations. Workstation one, two, three, and a fourth one at the back. Fourth one's dedicated for when we're doing XN's body capture. In order to network the workstations together, we have a simple network setup. We also have combined that with a Wi-Fi router so that we can use a Wi-Fi router, one Wi-Fi router dedicated for when we do VCAM, another Wi-Fi router dedicated for doing face capture, or in this case, we could be also doing Mocapi. I'm actually showing you Mocapi in a tethered mode. So we found the Mocapi data is actually better when we convert the lightning to Ethernet and stream that directly to the engine rather than Wi-Fi but you can choose the mode that suits you and your configuration. The other thing you need to know when you're uh, capturing Mocapi and you need to have that data broadcast over line link, uh, it doesn't do multicast, it's a unicast. So you'll set the one IP to the one workstation in case, in this case, it's this one. And then you'll rebroadcast live link to the other workstations that need to see that live link data. I've also got uh, the AR kit here this we're streaming over the dedicated Wi-Fi to the Unreal Engine. And as long as you point the, um, set up all the IPs that you're pointing to the different workstations, they'll all be able to see the face in this case. With the XSense workstation, it has its own dedicated router, which is only for communicating to the XSense suit. 
you can have up to four suits, I think, capturing to one Wi-Fi router, but this is separate to any other Wi-Fi network that you have going on. It's dedicated for XSENS capture only, and you have to make sure that in the XSENS Movin software, that wherever you want the Live Link data to be going to, that you set up the target IP of each workstation it needs to go to. All right, Kevin, so you've mentioned a lot of different hardware and a few different sources of Live Link data coming in. How do you keep all of that synchronized? Timecode can be sent to the different uh, capture devices and can also be sent to the Unreal Engine. Okay. You can also send uh, sync to those same capture devices. Sync is, you could consider to be like the frame rate. So if you're at 24 frames per second, that's like a heartbeat, 24 heartbeats per second. Okay. Timecode tells you when those heartbeats occurred or when those pulses occurred in time. Okay, so sync is the same thing as Genlock then? That's correct. Okay, cool. So that's on more complex systems. So you can also um, set up the Unreal Engine so that you're not using an external timecode source. I'm right. going to show you how to do that in the next part of the guide. And then after that, I'll show you also how to set up more complex systems with timecode and Genlock. Cool. Let's jump in there and check it out. In a simple setup where you do not expect to be re-importing source state at a later date, you record everything straight into Take Recorder in UE. Data will not be synchronized and record as it arrives in Unreal Engine. If differences are noticeable, then you may need to shift tracks in sequencer by eye. It is recommended when recording in this manner that in UE project settings, custom time step is set to Genlock's fixed rate custom time step. So um, there's no media profile running. I'm going to show you in project settings. Bring that up. Search for time. It's going to be under the general settings. I'm just going to scroll down. General settings, and so you can see the effect. I'm actually going to show you the time data monitor, which shows our Genlock and time code. So at the moment, you can see we're red, there's no time code provider, and there's no Genlock. So in our project settings, I come over here, custom time step, I'm going to change the Genlock fixed custom time step, and time code provider stays as none. Generate default time code, and here you can change your rate. Already you can see in the time data monitor, it's giving you the green light that these settings are being applied. You can see I can change to 25, change to different frame rates here as needed. So far we've reviewed how to record into the Unreal Engine when you don't have an external time code source. However, for the Viz guide, we're going to show you how we set up in the lab using an external time code source as well as sync. This is important when you have a variety of capture systems. We have the XSENS, we have the AR face kit that we're sending time code to, and it allows us to then synchronize as the live link data comes in, time code relative to each other. So in the lab, we have uh, all of our workstations are set up with the Aja Kona 5 card, which has a dedicated pin for sync, as well as a dedicated cable for time code. The hardware that we're going to use for our master clock is the ambient locket which I have here. We have time code running on it. I have our time code coming to a distribution amplifier for time code. This takes the one feed and then it allows me to send it out to a variety of different sources. In this case, we have time code that is going to the tentacle sync. And then via Bluetooth, this will get sent to the iPhone, which I'll show you here. This has tentacle sync on it. Time code is now running and it's based on the same time code because it's been sent from the ambient master clock. And if I go to the AR face kit, you can see I've chosen the tentacle sync as my time code source. And then when my face is there, you have you can see time code is running there as well. So that's the phone. We also have time code going through this cable, goes to our Aja Kona 5 to our Unreal workstation. We also have time code going out, and in this case, this is our dedicated XSENS machine, which takes time code through audio. So this is a, an alternative to using the Kona 5 card, where you can actually use the microphone in jack to take LTC audio. This is not uh, VITC, which is a video signal, but LTC audio into the XSENS workstation, and then the XSENS data will get striped with time code. The other part that we have here is Genlock. If, if sync is required, 
for synchronization between different external devices. We have sync coming again from our ambient master blocket, goes into another distribution amplifier, and then we can send our sync signal out to our different workstations. XSense does not take sync, it only takes time codes, but we could be sending sync to the Unreal box. Um, if we're using motive for optical tracking, that would also take a sync input and use the same sync source for that. Awesome, thanks for that, Kevin. So now that we've checked out the hardware that we're using at the lab, Juan, what's the next step? Well, the next logical step is just to create a project, especially for virtual production. For that, we have a template that pre-configures Unreal Engine with the, all the necessary plugins. So let's take a look. Now I'm gonna show you how to set up your Unreal Engine virtual camera. I highly recommend starting a project from the virtual production template. So whenever you wanna create a new project, you can always go to film and video and then pick virtual production. You give the name to your project. And this will, all, this will basically turn on a bunch of plugins that you might need. Okay, now that I just created a new project using the, the virtual production template, I'm gonna check that the, all my plugins are in fact loaded. So I'm gonna go open the plugin window. And I, first of all, I'm gonna search for virtual camera. As you can see, I have virtual camera and virtual camera core turned on, which is correct. The second thing I wanna check is that I have take recorder. The recorder is on and take recorder multi-user synchronization is also on. I'll, I'm gonna need both. And the last one I wanna check is light link. Light link plugin is on. This, these four plugins are on by default with the virtual production template. But in case you didn't start it from the virtual production template, now you know those are the four plugins that you need to enable. Okay, so now, next thing what I wanna do is create a VCAM actor. So I go into virtual production and I click the VCAM actor. So when I create a VCAM actor, it actually creates two actors. The VCAM actor, which is the one that has the, the HUD, and all the, all the UI. And then there is another one that's called VCAM, VCAM actor underscore record. So when we actually do a take record, the same animation gets applied to the VCAM actor record. This one is the one that's gonna have the proper settings, the film back, the lenses, without the HUD applied to it. And when you create a VCAM actor by default, it's enabled, and that's why it doesn't let you uh, move your viewport, even if you eject, it doesn't still, doesn't allow you to move the viewport. So I want to disable it. And now I'm free to move around. One thing that I like to do is create a hierarchy for a parent node for the VCAM, just in case you need to reposition this, the camera or if you need to constrain the camera to a moving object or to a crane or to a, a dolly. So usually when I go in, I create an empty actor. This empty actor, I will call it a VCAM stage, or you can call it whatever you want. And then I will, I will parent the VCAM actor under this, under the VCAM stage, and I will zero out. That way, this VCAM actor, the VCAM stage, it's a zero, zero, and then the VCAM actor is parent underneath, and whenever I'm doing a VCAM, it doesn't matter, it will, it will inherit the properties, the transformation of the VCAM, but if there is any, for any situation, let's say uh, the VCAM operator is asking you to reposition, that's how you can actually just reposition the top VCAM, act, VCAM stage, because once the VCAM is enabled, you cannot move this VCAM in editor. You must always enable the VCAM component before trying to connect your LiveLink VCAM iOS app with Unreal Engine session. Even if you have the correct IP address for your workstation in the iPad, if your VCAM component is not enabled, you will get the error couldn't connect, could not connect to the server message. 
So once again, when you are about to start your Beacon app application, you must enable this. Once this is enabled, you can just connect your Beacon app. It is ideal that you have a dedicated Wi-Fi router for your Beacon app and make sure that, is, that the same Wi-Fi router is connected to the same network as your computer so you can guarantee a good connection. If you're working in an office or a home and you know that it's only you or really, really few devices connected to that Wi-Fi, it should be fine. But if you're working in an office where that Wi-Fi is being used by many people, you might not get a proper, uh, a clean signal between Unreal Engine and the iPad. So now let's download the LiveLink Vcam app from the App Store and let's launch the app. Once the app opens, let's type our address, IP address, and then we click Connect. Now my Vcam is connected to my Unreal Engine instance. Okay, so I want to show you how important it is to set VP roles for VCAM. Uh, by default, you most likely don't have any VP roles assigned to your show or your project. So I'm just going to show you what's going to happen. For example, here I have an Unreal Engine instance and another one or daily multi user. And if I enable the VCAM actor, then this this Unreal Engine instance gets the, the VCAM HUD. The same is going to happen with the other one, right? So we can see they're both getting possessed by the, the VCAM. And I cannot move, as you can see, right? And even if I eject, it doesn't really let me eject. It's because VCAM is currently assigned to any editor that's part of the multi-user session. So let's change that. So what I'm going to do, I need to create VP roles. The way you do that is by clicking on the BP roles icon here at the top, and then we can actually add a role. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna create a VCAM role, and then I'm gonna hit enter, and I'm gonna add another role, which is the editor. And you can create as many roles as you need in order to define roles for your computers that are gonna participate in the multi user session. So now that I have a role that is called VCAM, if I go into the VCAM actor and in, in the VCAM component, I can now change this to whatever role is created. In this case, I'm going to pick VCAM. So as, as you know now, this VCAM actor is looking for any computer that has VCAM as a role. And right now, I'm checking that this computer has VCAM, the other computer doesn't have that role. And then if I hit enable, now, this computer gets it, the other one doesn't. So now that we've seen how we can get the virtual camera hooked up into the editor, let's check out some other options we have for camera movement. What do you got here, Juan? That's right. Well, right here, I have a custom virtual camera rig. And the reason why we did this is because a lot of cinematographers, they are more accustomed to things like this, you know, the weight and feel of a real camera. Got it. So in order to do that, we put together a video. Our friends in the Epic London Lab put a video that's going to show you how to create a custom rig like this. Cool, let's roll it. Hi, my name is Ben and I'm based in the Epic London Innovation Lab. I'm excited to be sharing with you today some of the hardware options you have for VCAM, the pros and cons of each, and perhaps also to inspire you to build your own. So here we are on our virtual production stage in London where we've got various equipment, including an in-camera visual effects LED wall. We had that on in the background to provide a, a backdrop uh, to help us immerse into the performances, but really it's not necessary for VCAM. iPads and iPhones are a fantastically simple and accessible solution for VCAM because they contain everything you need to get started, a display, tracking and user input. We've designed our VCAM iOS app to fully leverage the hardware and therefore, if you already have an iPad, you already have everything you need to get started. So the pros here that it's accessible, it's lightweight and compact, really an all-in-one solution, and maybe one that you already have. The cons, well, the performances can maybe feel as if they're shot on an iPhone or a tablet. You know, it's, it's a lightweight device, so it comes with that lightweight 
handheld feel. Also, the tracking from AR Kit is an absolute world space in the sense that if you pick it up and put it down, you're not always necessarily starting in the same place each time. iOS devices offer you an easy hardware platform to get started with, but they're also easily customizable to extend their physical functionality beyond the form factor of a tablet. In this example, we have created a hybrid, combining an iPad with a Vicon optical tracking system with Bluetooth Joy-Con controllers which slot into customised wooden handles, all attached to a frame. These were fun to make and I'd encourage you to explore options beyond what is available off the shelf based on your specific project needs. Work with what you know, if that's 3D printing, CNC machining or just gaffer tape and popsicle sticks. If it works, it works. Build what you need based on what you can build. This example is a great option for us because while it's lightweight, we're leveraging the benefits of an optical tracking system and the option to use the touchscreen along with mapping specific functions to the Joy-Cons, buttons, triggers and joysticks. The Joy-Cons are Bluetooth connected to the PC which is hosting the editor session, powering the VCAM, rather than them being paired directly to the iPad. You may want to consider customising a tablet based VCAM, not just for comfort, or technical reasons, but also to influence the creative style and performance of a VCAM recording. For example, you might want to consider a lightweight shoulder mount or popping an iPhone in a gimbal. Both of these things would give you different performances. So the pros. So this brings a variety of performance styles to break away from it feeling like it's shot on an iPad. It's cheap and accessible uh, and brings the benefits of the other tech you introduce, i.e. the tracking and, and buttons, etc. It's accessible based on what you need and what you can achieve. The cons are, well, depending on uh, what you've put together, it may not be as robust as a production grade solution, which we'll explore next. So for production grade solutions, we can consider that uh, perhaps we move away from an iPad based VCAM and go for a video based solution. Let's cut back to the lab and take a tour of our system. So at the core of any VCAM system uh, is a screen, so we can see what we're doing. And of course, in this case, it's a video monitor. And this is receiving a signal via this wireless Faxis receiver. And we have power coming from the battery. We have time code coming from a tentacle sync. And it's not top screen in the sense that it can interact with Unreal. And so we've got these Joy-Con controllers. Uh, and these are Bluetooth to the PC and allow us to make lens changes, for example. These are quite adaptable and we can slide these out nice and easily and move them around into different configurations. On top, we've got our tracking crown. And as you can see, depending on what position we are physically holding the VCAM in, we can simply change the Vicon crown to a point uh, where it is most comfortable for me to work. So even if I wanted to point it down, I can lift it up and, uh, and be looking down. Here we are on the back of our VCAM cart. So this is the Vaxis transmitter that was providing the signal over to the VCAM wirelessly. And this is a SDI cable that's feeding that. And that's actually being converted from HDMI, which is coming out the back of the machine. And so if we take a look around the front of our cart, essentially the VCAM display is essentially another Windows, mono, uh, Windows display. So with that, we can feed our VCAM a viewport. What I've shown you so far though, is just the core of our VCAM, because this VCAM is set up so that we can transform it from a handheld to a shoulder rig or onto a tripod. Each of these different um, configurations change the performance and we use them interchangeably based on the type of shot we want to capture. As we touched upon earlier with the shoulder mount, the nature of your body movement completely changes dependent on the rigging and therefore this directly influences the creative performance of your VCAM work. This could, for example, help you achieve a camera performance that brings the audience closer to the action as your body movement derived from your hips and your upper torso as opposed to your arms and hands. It can replicate the feeling of a first person camera performance, often associated with high energy documentaries and up close action sequences. 
So the pros here is that these can be very robust and can handle the most vigorous of performances day in, day out. They can be very low latency and weighted to carry momentum as we discussed with regards to the performance. The cons, well, it can be more physically demanding to use depending on your strength and how heavy the unit is. And it's usually more expensive than the other options that we looked at. So I hope this has been a useful overview of the various VCAM hardware solutions available to you. But most importantly, I hope this has inspired you to put together a VCAM perfect for your needs. Thank you very much. And I'd be very excited to see what you come up with. So I noticed in Kevin's hardware section, as well as Juan's virtual camera section, in the lab, you guys are using multiple computers. How do you yeah. manage that and keep everything kind of moving forward? Yeah, yeah. So there's two main things that you have to keep in mind. One is that we want to get all the machines to be able to join into the same multi-user session, okay. which is this instance of Unreal where we can all get, get together and see each other and be able to work uh, and to be able to work collaboratively. So kind of like a sandbox. Yeah, Everybody's yeah. doing mm -hmm. the same thing all together at yeah, the same totally. time. Totally. Cool. This, the, now the second thing, uh, we have to make sure that uh, all the content on each on each machine is the same. So here at the lab, we use Perforce okay. for our source control, and we need to make sure that each machine is on the same change list. Great. So for those of you who don't use source control, change list basically means the same version of the data. So that makes perfect sense. So how do you do that? Yeah. So to to save us from having to walk around each machine and you know manually launching Unreal and opening each level, we've developed this Python application called Switchboard, where we can sit at one machine and be able to uh, launch all uh, launch the machines into Unreal, make sure they're on the same change list, make sure that we can get into a multi-user server. Uh, yeah, it's great. Cool. Sounds like one-stop shopping. So let's yeah. check it out. Switchboard is a customizable. Python-based application for controlling multiple devices remotely. It is used at the core of many types of virtual productions, from in-camera VFX-style LED wall shoots to more performance capture-based shoots that we'll be talking about here today. At the stage, its functions are to keep all the devices synced to the same change lists and engine builds, as well as a way to easily launch them all into the same multi-user session. With the use of its companion application Switchboard Listener, you can communicate with multiple devices on the same network or VPN. After launching the Switchboard Listener on each machine, we can then add them to the UI by setting their respective IP addresses. We'll start with the local machine first, which will also be the addresses to our multi-user server. By clicking Add Device at the top, we can add this local machine by providing the name and an IP address. When we go to the settings, you'll see that Switchboard was able to automatically set the server IP as well as your source control project settings. When we connect the device to Switchboard, we can now see all the local current change lists. Now, Let's add a second machine to the same network or VPN. Give it a name and the IP address. Next, we'll go to the settings and scroll down to the bottom to fill out our source control information. I've copied the information that we need from the other computer into a document so we can easily paste it into the field. Once we've filled out everything correctly, we can close the settings and connect the device. If any of them are out of sync with the desired change list at the top, we'll see the numbers displayed in red. We can sync all the connected devices at the top, or we can do them individually. We'll sync them both here by clicking the sync icon at the top. Virtual production or VP roles can be also set using Switchboard. Based on a device's role, we can run custom logic in Unreal Engine. In this case, we are going to define which box will be the operator box and which box will run the virtual camera. 
We do this by going back to the settings and selecting a role under each device's section. Next, we'll connect our iOS device running Live Link Base. Name it and type in the IP address. We can find the phone's IP under the Wi-Fi section in the settings. Make sure that the machine we are connecting to has been added as the target device on your phone and the OSC is enabled. Once this is all done, we can connect the device. We'll know OSC is running on our device if we see a green dot next to the device. At the bottom of the UI, we can name and create a multi-user editing server to record all the transactions for the multi-user session when we launch in Rio. We can control what machines join to the multi-user session right from the switchboard by clicking the multi-user icon. Lastly, we'll choose a persistent level we want the session to open into. We can launch Unreal Engine on selected individual machines right here from switchboard, or you can hit the arrow at the top to launch Unreal on all the connected machines. After launching the session, we'll see the multi-user slate server window appear as well. We can refer to this window here to confirm that every machine has successfully connected to the session. Now that we have all the machines properly connected to Switchboard, synced to the same content and all launched in the multi-user session, we're now ready to start streaming in our performance capture. Let's look at how we get the live link motion data into Unreal and synchronized across all the machines. You can load the live link window by looking in the windows. Under virtual production, choose live link. We're going to add our XN source in the scene. And because our MVM puppet and blueprint is set to read this live link subject name, the animation applies. And because our Toothison retargeter is parented underneath, the animation comes across. When doing visualization, it's very important to be able to see your characters moving in the 3D world. This means characters that are huge should look huge in the engine, and non-humanoid characters that are oddly shaped should have as many of their body parts moving as necessary to tell the story. Here we can see the large Toothison creature in the background is receiving its body motion, including its additional arms, from the XSense puppet in the foreground. By opening up the Anim blueprint of the Toothison, we see it has a retarget pose from Mesh Node. This node points to the IK retarget asset that makes this possible. The IK retargeter enables any skeletal motion to transfer to any other skeleton, even if it has a different amount of limbs or those limbs have different amount of bones. The process of setting up a retarget is done first by defining an IK rig asset from all your skeletons, defining the joint chains for each, and then matching them together in the IK retarget asset. Here, the source IK rig asset is the MVN puppet. Clicking on the icon brings up the IK rig asset window. Here, each bone chain on the character is defined and named. Going back to the retargeter, we can also view the Toothison IK rig. Notice that there are extra arm chains defined that the source did not have. Also notice we can set up the full body IK targets and preview how the character can stretch to reach its targets. Back in the IK retargeter, the source chains are set to, to corresponding target chains. Even the extra arm can point to the same target arm chains to copy motion. Animations from the asset browser can then be previewed and scrubbed in the timeline. Once this relationship is established and there is a mapping set between the two characters, it is very simple to attach the follower character to the leader in the level. This can be done in real time or a collection of animations can be batch processed offline. This allows performers of any size to drive any character. Okay, so we've seen Live Link streaming data into the editor a couple of different times now. How do we work with that data once it's being streamed in? Yeah, well, we have this plugin called Take Recorder which basically takes any streamed motion or any simulated motion, and it plots that down to keyframes that are saved in level sequences. Awesome, so it's just like a standard level sequence then. So yeah. once that data is kind of baked into those, into those clips, 
we can edit it and work with it. Yeah. Awesome. Let's check it out. Take Recorder is a tool that enables the recording of gameplay animation, live performances, and a multitude of other sources directly into Unreal Engine. By recording and managing takes in Sequencer, we can achieve a highly iterative workflow. From the outliner, drag any number of actors you want to record into the source window and take recorder. Here we'll use our MetaHuman character. From here, we can set a number of preferences for the recording, such as which properties you want to record, whether the recorded actor will be possessable or spawnable, and the file name and save locations. For our character here, we'll set the record type to spawnable and disable record parent hierarchy. By doing this, we'll ensure that the character on playback will be at exactly the same spot and not dependent on any parent transforms. Next, we'll enable the take recorder settings by hitting the gears icon at the top right. Then we'll uncheck start at current timecode. For our purposes here today, we want the sequence to start at frame zero. Now we're going to set the slate name, frame rate, and add some comments describing the take. And when we're ready, hit the red button to record. You should see in Sequencer the data being plotted. Hit stop to end the recording. To review the shot, hit the review last recording button at the top of the UI. This will play back what was just recorded. Notice there are now two metahumans. Because we set our record type to spawnable, Sequencer has spawned a new copy. You can hide the original to see your performance more clearly. Okay, so we're ready for our shoot. We've got Sean on the box here. He's added the VCAM actor and the blueprint for the metahuman into our take recorder. So we will be recording that data. We've got Juan on the VCAM. He'll be recording the digital camera. And then we have Kevin in the Exen suit. And he'll be our metahuman hero actor, okay? So Kevin, you are walking down the street. You hear sound. There's a humongous monster behind you. You turn, you see it. You come back to camera. You emote, and then the camera looks up to see what it is you just saw. All right? Got it. Okay. Are we ready on the box? Ready. Okay. Okay, engine. <clears throat> One, engine speed. Camera ready. Action. Look back. Look forward. Scream. Camera up. Cut. Excellent. Good. All right, so now that we have all that live link data recorded yeah. with the take recorder, what are we going to do with it? Well, they're level sequences now, right? Okay. So we can open up in sequencer, we can play, we can review, we can make notes, we can blend clips together. Nice. So it's just like a nonlinear editor at this point. Exactly. All right, let's play around with it. Yeah. Cool. Now we load our level sequence. Make sure to activate the camera cuts track. So we look through our VCAM. Hit play and watch. For you. Okay. First of all, let's, intro let's say, hey, we need to introduce. We're, we're uh, Hello, everyone. <laughs> Juan's got a plan. He wants us to introduce ourselves no, again. No, I want to introduce Tony. Oh, Tony. Yes. Tony. Hey, Tony. How you doing, man? Tony, Tony, we are introducing, we're introducing you. You. Um, you heard Tony's, you heard Tony's voice and you saw, and you saw him in the video a bit. And, and uh, we just wanted to say thank you for joining, joining via Zoom. Zoom. He wasn't able to make it with us with live, today, live today, but he will be he helping, will be helping answer, answer some of the, some of the questions. Of the questions. So, so good to see you, good Tony. To see you, Tony. Hey, how you guys doing? Good to see you. We're not going to. Awesome. So let's get into the questions. Thanks again, everybody, for taking the time to watch this live uh, event with us. We had so much fun 
in the lab, creating it. So much amazing technology here. It was really inspirational to, uh, to get to see these guys in action. I don't hear anything. Juan, what is the future with the visualization guide? It's kind of where are we at and what, what's going on with it moving forward? Oh, we just released chapter two, uh, so make sure you check it out. And we are now working on chapter three, which is basically all covering about shoot, you know, what you do when you're doing a virtual production shoot. And eventually as technology is evolving, as we release more features in Unreal Engine, there is new technology available, we'll be updating the, the guide. Cool. Um, so we had some questions come in right off the bat asking about okay. that helmet. What was going on with that helmet that you were wearing, Kevin? <laughs> Okay. You want to grab the helmet? Yeah, I'll grab it. Hey, Daryl, we don't hear you. You guys don't hear us. It sounds a bit echo. Well, wait, hold on. Hold on. We, ha we have bars going out, though. My volume? Stand by. No, no, go, go for it. If we not, uh, uh, we, we have we bars, have going, bars out. going out. So, as, as, as people, people are, in the chat, can, chat, people, can hear people hear us? Or is it or just, is it on, just Zoom on Zoom that you're not, that you're not hearing us? us? Okay, we're okay, on YouTube, we're on YouTube so, so that's fine. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's because, because I had you guys muted, so um, sorry, sorry about that, Tony. Tony we're we're going to mute you so that we don't, so that we don't get a double echo, echo. so we'll only, you'll you'll only hear us on Zoom when we, when we, when we ask you a question. Sorry, sorry about that, man. No problem. I'll, I'll just be right here. <laughs> cool. So, cool. Sorry, everybody, the audience. A little confusion there. So we'll just keep moving forward. Yeah, so let's... It's a helmet. This is from Technoprops. So this is a more professional-style helmet able to attach your iPhone here. Um, has padding inside that you can customize. Keeps the phone like stable. Then we have other types, and one's gonna show you on the fly. It's um, a more cheap, a cheaper version. Cheaper version that we're trying to break. <laughs> so there's other people that are starting to manufacture these, uh, 3D print them. Um, this is more your home use. What's the brand on this? The brand. Uh, Nicholas cell phone support. So it's not even designed for doing this, but uh, <laughs> Sean found it on the fly. You can attach an iPhone that way. Another way of being able to capture your face. Very, very cool. So I'm actually going to kick another question to Tony here so that he, uh, he can jump into, jump this, into conversation this conversation. Tony, this. Tony, Tony, someone was someone asking, asking about Meta Human Animator. Animator. I figured, I figured this was a good, good, question, a good question for you to, for you to kind of, kind of answer in. Answer in. Yeah, so the MetaHuman Animator was just released. It's a new app. It also uses the uh, the iOS, and um, you can use it in virtual production, but it's not a real time uh, device, right? So there's some processing, and if you watch the GDC video, you'll see there's maybe like a 20 second or so, depending how long the clip is. So you could do your creations, you could record them, and then process them, and then you could import them, right? And same with Move AI, right? You can use this for for um, capturing your performance, but then you have to process it. So it's a little different than XN in that it's not real time. There's a little bit of a delay, but you could absolutely still use those in your uh, sequences. Very cool, very cool. So the another question that we got was, can I, can I, like, if I only have one computer, can, and this can go to, I guess, to any, any of you guys, if I only have one computer, can I record some motion, then come back and re-edit it, and then layer VCAM in on top of that later afterwards? Or you know, am I trying to do everything all at once? Yeah, you can definitely do things in the steps, especially if you only have one computer, one device. You, you probably will want to do your performance capture first, and then after you do your performance capture, you do the VCAM. Got it, okay. Another quick question. What if I don't have time code? Do I need that? So this is probably one for Kevin, I think. Or Tony. Yeah, or Tony. Um, if you don't have time code, you can use the uh, system time of your computer. So the difference is, as your live link data comes in, it'll get striped with whatever that computer time is versus um, if you're sending time code out to different sources, you need to process them later and bring that data in later, then you'll need to use some sort of external time code source. So when you review the video, I went through how to set up in project settings to use system time code, and it's also in the viz guide. Cool. So, Sean, here's one for you. What other input devices can be used with virtual production and visualization? Uh, any device that you can encode. Uh, okay. So, you know, any sort of uh, MIDI device or OSC device, uh, anything that can get on LiveLink. Uh, we have Blueprint libraries for all those sorts of uh, protocols. 
So just go nuts, have fun. Go um, nuts. Let's show the cool Noto wheels that we have. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, see, they, they have all the toys you could imagine here. Um, yeah. it, it really is pretty. Uh, yeah. It's maybe, maybe Juan will pull that out and show you guys that in just a second. Really cool yeah. Too. And we have sections in chapter two for uh, MIDI and for Live Link and for remote control. So yeah. kind of on, on devices and getting data in, what, what gloves do you guys recommend? That was a question that came up a couple times in the chat. Uh, there's, there's a lot of gloves that are out there. Ones that we've tested with um, are Stretch Sense. Um, there's also the Manus uh, VR gloves. These are all fairly pricey. I believe Stretch Sense is coming out with a glove later in the summer. Check out their website. It might be a price point around $600. Some of the higher end ones, you get better fidelity, but you could be paying like five or $6,000 for one glove or a pair of gloves. So do some research out there. We happen to use the Stretch Sense because we were in a testing mode, um, but we'd like to hear from other people if, if they've experienced other types of gloves. Awesome. awesome. So Tony, so here's, Tony, another, here's question another question for you, buddy. For you, buddy. It, it asks, asks, can I be can target, I be target multiple, characters multiple characters at the same, at the same time? time? Yes, absolutely you can. Um, if, if you're talking about having one character we target to, to multiple, oh, oh Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, we hear yeah, you, we hear you You're, You're good. Just keep going. Okay. Okay, sorry. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll circle, we'll circle back, back to this. Just a second. Oh, um, okay, so, yeah. Um, every character will have, like, the source will come in, and you can parent a, a child to it, and that character will, will basically, um, um, it will send the animation to that child character. So as long as they're parented inside the, the rig, Got it. Got Very it. Cool. Very cool. Good. 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 Thank you, man. Thank you, man. All right. So this this one's a general question for I guess all all of you. What what's your favorite part of your work? So, what what gets you guys excited to do that LA drive in here every morning and hang out at the lab? Other than all the cool blinky lights and LEDs everywhere and stuff like that. Okay, I'm gonna answer because I had the microphone. Yeah, you go for so it. My favorite part of my work is being able to play with this technology. You know, because the cool thing about virtual production. Uh, is that allows you just to iterate, just explore different things. You know, go you have the VCAM and say, okay, let me tell the story from the point of view of this character. So you 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 are basically now telling the story with the camera. Now you just go in and say, let me explore telling the story from another point of view, and then you start telling the story from a point of view, and then you review it live, real time, and you say, you know what, that actually is working. That or or or, or suddenly you discover new things about the story, you know, suddenly you say, let me play this specific sound for this character, and then this character becomes evil and mean, and then if you, if you suddenly play a slightly different audio for that character, then that character be can become magical or something. So is the real-time technology allow you to quickly explore? So it's not like you work so hard just to try one version, and then you run out of time, and you say, okay, that's the best I can do. With real time, it allows you to just try it as many times as possible, and then you find out the best way to tell the story or the best way to create your work. That's what I really enjoy. Yeah, that's awesome. Sean, you have any, any thoughts? Uh, my favorite part is probably when we're in here working uh, and we run into an issue or we, we figure out that things could maybe work a little better and we call up the devs and talk to the devs and we see those changes, you know, kind of, um, make their way into um, into unreal and, and just you know kind of being a part of that process and, and uh, you know having the power to try and make this process a little easier or better for people out there that are trying to use it. I mean, it really is changing super fast, yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah. it's a nascent technology in, in this yeah. use case, and it's just so inspiring to see how quickly it evolves. The yeah. engine, the engine, it's it's kind of kind of cool. Yeah. So, Sean, so you lied to me. What? You said that the best part of the job is working with me. Uh, no. that's, that's a second part of the job one. <laughs> close, close tie, yeah, yeah. Close, close number oh, yeah. two. Uh, cool. So here's an interesting question. Someone's asking about multi-user sessions. Is, if you know somebody's IP, are you good to go, or is it a little bit more involved than that? Uh, so you have to be on the same network, right? So you have to be either on the same VPN with somebody if they're not on your... Um, you know, your local area network or you need to be on the same local area network. Uh, but with VPNs, we get on the same multi-user session with people uh, across the world. So it's definitely possible. 
so some other questions kind of came in as far as hardware, and I think we, we kind of talked about this a bit about at the very beginning, you know, do I need a big crazy computer or can I do this on, on, on you know, something lower end? Uh, you can definitely get started. Uh, on a laptop, you could be using an iPhone for capturing face, so uh, that's your entry point. You can also attach uh, Xbox controllers. You can do all sorts of things already on a laptop and then scale yourself up from there. Like experiment, get creative, collaborate with someone else who's on a laptop, get in a multi-user session. And a little bit like we did in the Viz Lab is we had an idea of creating this guide and then we just started tweaking and adding things and adding layers of hardware. It's not like we said, oh, we have to have every, every device in the world. We started with things that were pretty simple and we've tried to explain it in the Viz Guide how you can get into this in simple forms but also take it to the next level of complexity. I want to highlight something. So with an iPhone, you can do VCAM, you can do facial capture. So right there, just a device that a lot of people own, you can actually do a lot, a lot of part of the virtual production. And then that laptop, you know, definitely needs to be, depends on how the content that you put in your project. If it's something that you want to do ray tracing and you want to do a crazy amount of characters, you know, the more you're asking Unreal Engine to do, the, the the better the GPU and the CPU that you need. So it's all about a balance of the quality and what you can afford. Got it, very cool. So this, this actually is a pretty interesting question. So someone is coming in from a, from a gaming background and they're using Unreal Engine to, to make cinematics for their games and they're, they're asking if they can use these plugins from the virtual production presentation that we did today in a, in a non-virtual production kind of workflow. Like, do they have access to that? Yeah, uh, all the plugins that we've used today, I think all the plugins, um, ship with the engine. Uh, and then, you know, all the apps like um, Vcam or Live Link Face, you can just get from the App Store. But, um, yeah, I mean, if you started from a games template, there's nothing saying that you can't load those plugins and, and um, use these techniques. The only plugins that, that we use that don't ship with the engine are the third-party plugins. You know, the things that we need, for example, Xens. Yeah. We need to download and the Xen we'll plugin and we'll copy. So we, we, I know we weren't going to mention it, but someone asked who's driving the monster right now. So <laughs> the secret's out. Kevin is yeah. always... In a, in a my cop, copy system here, um, this is what we're using in the Viz Guide as well as Xens. And in the lab here, we also have an optical tracking system. Um, we have a Vive system, so we've, we've tried to experiment with just different types of capture, and uh, yeah, here I am. Excellent, and Rococo as well. I'm disappointed that nobody has asked a question to the monster <laughs> yet. Yeah. What's, what's your favorite part of uh, coming to the lab? As uh, the monster. Being, As the monster, the what's monster your favorite part? The director's chair. So another, another qu several questions came in about MetaHuman Animator and like what that workflow would look like in something like this. So maybe, maybe Sean, you could talk to that for a second. Yeah, um, MetaHuman Animator, you could definitely use. The, the, um, the upside is that it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's going to look great. Uh, the downside in this particular instance is that it's not real time, right? So you don't get that real time feedback. Um, it may be a little slower to, uh, iterate over um, you know the workflow might be you know once you start kind of figuring out where you want to be and and what your story is maybe switch from live link face to uh, meta human animator just just kind of for that last push cool so totally different question than the ones that we've been taking previously what alternatives are there to perforce like what other source control solutions Anybody? like github Plastics. plastic uh, yeah. subversioning okay. git yeah, there's, there's a few of them out there. Yeah, usually in the Unreal Engine, where you go and, and look at the source control options and the drop down, you will see the, the available options. Someone's asking who's where. Yes, it's a mocap suit that, that's driving the monster currently. Um, max number of users in a multi session. I know that we, we did test some of that a while ago. What, yeah. what if, what if, did you guys do some more since then? And what have you gotten it up to? So we did a, during pandemic, we actually did a test where we wanted to see how we can work together globally. And we were able to test 14 people all over the world. We had people connected, Japan, Korea, London, Germany, uh, Montreal, 
Cary, Los Angeles, all over the place. And we were able to do, we were able to work the 14 of us together. But at the end, it's like, doesn't really make sense to have 14 people in the same file working at the same time. It becomes a little chaotic. So I think it's not about the limit, it's about really how many people you need to have together working. Right. I'll make one comment about that. Also, it's, uh, when you're in multi-user, it's important to define roles. So when we were doing this, we'd have the DP is in there, so he's working with the lighting. The camera operator is in there, he's working with the camera. The mocap guys know what their roles are. So even though you can jump into multi-user, it's good to have that conversation that, so that you're not um, working at cross purposes. Cool, so this is actually a fairly technical hardware question. Um, someone's asking about Genlock and non-Quadro based cards. So I guess they're asking, I think I know in the Quadro cards, if you wanted to Genlock out for the wall, you needed, you needed a Quadro card for that. But if you're just yeah. trying to do Genlock for, for kind of visualization, you yeah, can do you, that with the yeah, object. Yeah, you don't card. need the Quadro sync cards for that. That's for um, synchronizing through end display, multiple configurations of um, LED walls or, yeah. So when we're talking about Genlock here, it's uh, synchronizing different capture sources. So you're sending out the same pulse so that when, if you have a video camera and it's Genlock to that same pulse, when it fires the shutter, that's doing the trigger at the same time as your motion capture software. Um, any other devices that can take in Genlock. And we'll sync the engine as well. So say you're capturing at 24 frames per second and you have a Genlock signal, you can make sure that not only do you use time code to synchronize everything, but everything occurs on the exact same frame. Cool, so this is, this is actually a pretty cool question. Someone's asking, they, in, the, in the take section we were spawning when we were doing the take, and they're asking if you can spawn multiple takes to do something like a crowd. Uh, so yeah, you can spawn as many things as 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 your engine can handle. Uh, you just you know kind of uh, keep putting more and more things in sequencer and setting them to spawnable. Um, we have m multiple uh, kind of ways to to do crowds in the engine. What's what's the latest one? It's it's like um, mesh to or uh, to do crowds. Uh, um, the Vertex animator yeah, animations. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, there is also other plugins for crowds. Atom is another one. Yeah, but uh, you can there is do also Niagara ways yeah. to do particles, uh, drive crowds, drive crowds via Niagara, and and um, and those can all be uh, spawnable. Yeah. So another, this is actually kind of circling back to a hardware question. That someone was asking about the um, the rig that you showed earlier, how that's tracked at at, at our at our innovation lab here. Sure. We have it right behind us. One's going to pull it over. And we also have a, a HTC Mars system, which uses a Vive tracker. Um, so we have a four Vive base stations, so we can do it that way. We could also pop this off. If you, when you hold that. We can swap it over. We have a yeah. mode of optical system. And then we can change it to now we're tracking with a, a puck. Yeah, maybe if you go up there. So again, for camera tracking, HTC Mars using the Vive is obviously a cheaper price point than a full-blown optical system. Um, I think it's about four and a half thousand dollars. Takes time code, gen lock, and that's getting more into the ICVFX uh, workflow. And you can see here we're using a Shogun monitor. Um, we have a Teradec on here, so like in the guide um, that Ben and the London team are showing, this is definitely a higher end, more expensive solution. Yeah, it's it's fairly cool. Very, very cool. Someone yeah, was, um, cool. yes, the videos will be fully recorded and you'll be able to watch it back later again if you want to go back and, and go through it. That is definitely happening. Um, someone asked, do you ever run into problems when you're animating? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> it happened to us, I no, think. Oh, no, no. Animating, live streaming, no. you know, can, can, always, can always be fun. How do you manage large amounts of data, projects, folders? I mean, for me, this is just get on source control. You yeah. know? Uh, have a really good naming convention. Figure that out before you start, if you can. 
um, it's easier to start clean and organize than it is to go back in afterwards and try and clean everything up. I mean, this is just kind of basic uh, asset management, CG kind of 101. I don't know if y'all have any better pieces of advice other than just don't be sloppy. Well, the other thing is just not to add extra stuff that you never need. For example, I see a lot of people that they, they have textures that are 8K resolution, and in reality, you're never going to see the 8K. You can actually still have the source file be 8K, but when you import it into a real engine, the texture, you can actually say the maximum resolution. So it allows you just to re-import that, that texture at a higher resolution if it's needed, but at least when you import it the first time, it doesn't have the big footprint. Yeah, definitely, definitely in terms of uh, figuring out your folder structure, your file naming convention, like Sean was saying. So folder structure within your project. So you break things into environments, uh, materials, uh, things like that. I think we, we may have a page on that. We do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, in, in chapter one. Chapter one. Yeah. See the viz guide. <laughs> yeah. Back, see, the, back, see the viz guide. Back, back to the one. viz guide. Uh, the yeah. Viz I mean, guide. one other thing to talk about, especially when you're where, when you're take recording, which you know we'll probably end up coming back to and talking again in chapter three. Just you know, also another thing with the engine is to make sure that your files are properly quarantined, right? Like you don't want to be in one level messing with one material, and then you realize that you kind of screwed up, you know, six other levels. Uh, down the road, so so definitely a, a little bit of pre-planning uh, def uh, goes can save you a lot of time. I I don't I don't think what we talk a lot in the Viz guy about collections. Mm. I love collections. You know, collections help things yeah. get organized. Collections is basically a way how you can basically collect items that are important. Uh, you know, so make sure you take a look at collections. Here's a f actually really fun question. Any future plans for Switchboard? And maybe you guys could talk just a bit about you know Switchboard. It is a Python-based application and the extensibility that it, it has and kind of where it's at and where it's going. Yeah, so that is, Switchboard is always improving, improving. And I do know that they're working on a new UI. So yeah, just keep an eye on, on every release. It pretty much just. And the nice thing about it is, you, is um, since it's Python-based, you can even uh, write your own uh, plugins for it, or you can write your own wrapper for it. Uh, there's plenty of studios that have kind of gone in and um, you know, kind of uh, made it to what they they kind of want. So. Got it, got it. So someone's asking about the size of the tracked volume. So we, we do have oh, geez. some some uh, we do have a couple so, two volumes, right? Yeah, we actually have uh, three volumes here. The one we're sitting in. This is about a, maybe a ten foot by a twenty foot. Uh, capture area. Um, it's really for innovation and testing. Yes, we could do body capture in here, but you wouldn't be able to move around a lot. Great thing with the XNs is then we could be firing that up for Mercapi and then we could roam further away. Um, when we did the intro of the video, we we're out on the IC VFX, our stage, uh, and testing out there. There we have 50 cameras doing full blown body capture, again, using the motive system, and that's a 30 by 45 feet. Um, yeah, so we're kind of lucky here. We, we can work in parallel with uh, multiple teams here doing optical capture and uh, inertial capture. So one thing I want to emphasize is one of the goals of the visualization guide is just to show all the technology, but at the same time, let you guys know that you can do a lot of this in a small place, in, at your home, in a small office with, little, with few computers. So. The you know, virtual camera, for example, has a scale functionality that allows you just to do big traveling shots without having to travel that much. And you know, if you use uh, one of these inertia motion systems like Mocopi or Exens, you, you can actually just find any corner around your office or house with, that you can run or perform your action. So us being here at this lab doesn't mean this is what you need to do. This is, that doesn't mean this is the type of equipment and facility that you need. You can do this at home. We, a lot of times, we do the projects from our home, just prototyping, and, and that gets the job done. Cool. Well, we're kind of at the top of the hour here. We actually went a little bit over, and it looks like we've gotten through most of these questions. I'd like to thank everybody for hanging out with us today, and we really enjoyed working on this content. The visualization guide that these, these folks have been working on is, is uh, it's going to continue to move forward. It's going to have more chapters coming out. I think chapter two just dropped. And 
you know, so keep, keep checking back on that and, and hopefully you all will make, make the jump and start doing visualization inside of Unreal. It's, yeah. it's, uh, make some movies. It's ready. It's Send ready to do it. Send them to us. We want to see them. <laughs> and I, and I want to thank you to all, all of our partners and everybody who helped us put together yeah. the visualization guide. We interview a lot of top professionals uh, because this guide is basically the, all the knowledge from the top professionals, not only from Epic. So I want to thank you all that were part of this. And more of your information is going to be in the next chapters. Awesome. And thank you, Tony, for being up there in the, in the top of the screen. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's basically it. So I think we're... Thanks. Awesome. Also, thank, right. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the developers for making such amazing tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Thank you, Monster. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> all right. Cheers, everyone.